Hello everyone and welcome back to the Mystery Theory Podcast. Today we're going to talk about Lindsay Busiak. This was somewhat of a recent request by John Dorian and I decided to start digging in this case that was kind of confusing in the beginning because there is a lot of information out there but there is also um, a lot of conflicting theories some of them I mean I don't know where they came from they have no backup they have no nothing to prove that it's true and there are some others that do so I'm gonna kind of jump in and share with you the case and also the latest updates because this is something that it's unsolved but it's not a cold case and the police is working on it and they have an idea and they probably know what happened in their heads but they need um, that person who can open up and really um, will solve this crazy case that has no physical evidence no fingerprints no nothing that really they can go with and if you know about this case you probably know about the theories so i'm gonna explore a few of those unfunded theories i'm gonna share them with you but i'm not going to dwell on them because i think there is more information today out there that is um, based on uh, the authorities and based on some police statements that are a little bit more i don't know they make a little bit more sense in my head so that's what we're gonna do today i am assuming this is going to be a pretty long podcast so just bear with me and know that in order to kind of make up your own mind or trying to figure things out in this case you probably have to listen to the entire podcast and understand the different details that i'm going to share with you today so i hope that you join me and i hope that if you have a completely different belief if you think you know that uh, that um you believe in one of those theories that today are not um based on any reliable source and but you absolutely believe in it and then i hope i don't um i hope you don't see me as trying to change your mind i'm just sharing with you things that i found about this case and some of the most reliable sources i could find so let's talk about lindsay um briefly she was born november 2nd 1983 so she's uh, was one year and two days younger um than me so it's kind of an interesting thing they're over there and kind of something that i try to find in every case so i can relate um dates birthdays the date that they had when they died so all the things that i tried to relate somehow so i can understand that lindsay you know today we see her she was a beautiful girl and you know it's now lindsay it's a picture to us people who didn't get to know her but once i try to find that connection lindsay becomes a real human being in my head i don't know if i can um, explain that to you but really that's pretty much it i do that relation in order to hey think well she'll be you know 36 years uh, old this year or it should be in, in kind of um relate to a real human being who lost her life in a horrible way now her mom is evelyn and her dad is jeff buziak she had one sister her name is sarah and we're not gonna dwell too much in her childhood because it's pretty normal and had nothing to do with what happened to her but if we fast forward to 2008 she was 24 24 years old 
and she now is a real estate agent. Um, she is a rookie at the office that she's working at, but she was described as ambitious and driven with a promising start to her career. And, you know, she was dating this guy, his name is Jason Zalo, who happened to be in the business too, and who was coming from a family who was doing very well, um, was very uh, successful real estate. Um, they had a very successful real estate business. And surely, uh, uh, Lindsay's manager happened to be Jason's mom. As far as her personal life, she was the pretty popular girl. She had lots of friends that she kept in contact with all the time. She was very outgoing. She was always fun. She was um, the kind of person that you look for when you want to have fun. She had a re great relationship with her family, with her sister, um, and with both mom and dad, even though they got divorced when she was very young. In late January 2008, Lindsay received a call that I guess every real estate agent wishes for this call, right? Uh, there was a, this was this lady who said that she had a budget of one million dollars and that she needed a house pretty fast. Um, they were going to be in Victoria, British Columbia, which I didn't mention in the beginning, but that's where Lindsay lived and um, they were going to be in the area for three days to find the home that they were going to move to and they kind of had those three days to find the house and try to close the deal something that was very interesting in this call is that they were very specific they were looking for a three-bedroom home with three bathrooms pretty close to downtown and they wanted a nanny suite which it is not unheard of but it's not one of the most popular demands for in a home at least um, that is something that well and having a million dollar budget for a home i mean there's people that do have that budget but this was kind of a specific request that she got now she felt a little bit uneasy with this call itself. Um, she mentioned to one of her friends that she, this lady had a, what she thought was a fake accent, something that sounded Spanish, but not really. And so why fake the accent? It was kind of weird, but, um, Lindsay also, I mean, she didn't know, um, why the lady didn't call the office that was also something very interesting um this lady called her personal cell phone and by the way this cell phone was still listed as hers and it was published everywhere but it was kind of interesting and totally relate to lindsay here i guess because we're both born in november and i don't know we have that kind of um a wondering mind but she wondered why her you know why specifically call her and she doesn't have much experience they're going to buy a million dollar home why not call the listing agent of a specific house that according to some theories they even mentioned the house that they wanted to go to um, they they briefly told her about this place that it was in the Sosa. This was a cul-de-sac. Even though, I mean, they could have called the listing agent. It was very very weird. Let's just put it like that. So Lindsay, again, totally relate to this. <laughs> she asked the lady, "Where did you get my number from?" In a very kind way, and the lady said, "Well." previous client of yours gave me your cell phone. So Lindsay, after ending the conversation, decided to call the client and find out who this lady was and, you know, if in fact this client shared her phone number um, with them. And um, anyways, the 
client never picks up sound of town i don't know if it's a lady or a guy or a guy but mm, whoever didn't pick up now there are some conflicting um uh, i don't know speculation is that is that even a speculation i don't know some people say that she told jason that jason her boyfriend that she was a little bit uneasy about this whole thing and it could have been that she felt uneasy with the idea of this lady calling her and she not maybe she thought that this was some kind of a scam where we don't know why she was so uneasy with the whole situation but according to some sources when she told jason about this he reassured her that she'll be fine that would be a great commission and she should totally start looking for houses for this couple there is also um it was also said that she called her dad and told him about it we don't know if this just happened in a normal conversation or like oh by the way i got called by this lady who wants to buy a house for a million dollar but kind of fishy because i don't know her or what the deal was but sources say that the dad did hear about her uneasiness with this couple some sources say that jason even said you know what don't worry i can even stop by and wait for you outside it will be fine you know it's it's kind of crazy to think that um she had that little uneasiness inside of her because if you're a real estate agent correct me if i'm wrong but i'm pretty sure that you know that you're going to meet people more than likely not everyone that you're gonna sell a house to will be your friend your neighbor or your co-worker more than likely you're going to try to find strangers that want to buy a house with you so she was new maybe that's why she felt uneasy or don't you think it's very interesting to know that she felt uneasy even though her job description kind of tells you that she was supposed to meet with strangers all the time. Anyways, just a thought. Now, between the first conversation and the time that they met to see the first house, they exchanged six different calls. They finally set up a time, 5.30 on Saturday, February the 2nd. Now, this was an upscale suburb in Victoria and Lindsay um, had, had a list of other houses that she found in the budget to show them but this was the first house and the house had allegedly this couple mentioned that they wanted to see and also interestingly enough this was the one house that met every single request that the couple had coincidence i don't think so it was almost like they were in my head it was almost like they were making an appointment to meet with her there which has absolutely makes absolutely no sense because if i knew a house okay i saw the house i know i like it i know it has everything i have i'm gonna call the listing agent and try to not involve so much commission into different real estate agents that's my thought but again uh, now looking back yeah it was a little bit suspicious and she had that feeling now at some point it was reported that in one of those calls lindsay uh, and the new clients the lady told lindsay again we have no name for this lady that she was going to Oh, go alone because something happened to her husband and um, yeah she was going to take a look at the house by herself now this is not a hundred percent confirmed um, and it was a conversation between two people uh, one of them were trying to find out who she is and the other one is not alive anymore so it's kind of hard to say that that actually happened but 
it is said that maybe there's some record, maybe there's a, you know, some kind of a note that Lindsay uh, wrote down saying she called, she's going to come by herself. Maybe that's that. But I can't really tell you where that information is coming from. But it's very well known and it's part of her case. So it was February 2nd, 2008. This was a Saturday afternoon. And Lindsay had lunch with her boyfriend, Jason, and left the place at 4.24 p.m. This was in a restaurant. They left separately. She took her car because she needed to go home to change to go to her appointment at 5.30. And Jason had to go to an auto shop to pick up a colleague. Now, it is said and confirmed that this colleague was a, a hockey player. They were not professional soccer, well, soccer, <laughs> hockey players, but they, they, they played together. And it is also confirmed that it's in this auto shop, Jason went for business purposes. And I'm not meaning by that, that he was going to take his car to get it fixed. I'm saying that the guy was selling and so he was the listing agent for his sale. Okay. Now, Jason got there and left at around 5.30. So he went to the auto shop, pick up his friend and the one that was going to go with him to the hockey game that they had that night. So he said, well, let's go. But before that, I need to stop by Lindsay's uh, appointment. So he texted her and say, you know, they were texting back and forth, but um, he eventually text in and say, I'm going to be a little bit late. You know, this house was a new build and it's very important that you know all this information because in the end it ties to different stories. It was on 1702 the Sosa place. This is a private and awkward to park cul-de-sac. I should know. I lived in one for 14 years and it's kind of weird how you have to park your cars if you are invited to a house. It's just weird. You know, it's a, it's kind of a circle, but then you have a little bit of space. Some people park like um, parallel, some other people park. It, it's kind of weird to park in a cul-de-sac with all the driveways and all the craziness. Okay. I know that it makes sense. But the side of the property and the back of the property was kind of, um, was parallel to Torque Drive. Let's call it a busier street, okay? And the side of the house and the, and the back of the house, it was all fenced in. This was a new build again. And it's been sitting for a year now, by now for 960 so it, it was kind of a little bit less than a million dollars but it fit perfectly in the budget now remember that i told you that the husband was not meant to come well he ended up being there with the wife and um there was a neighbor walking by and she was walking her dog and she said that she saw the couple shaking hands introducing themselves outside the home to Lindsay. Now, the man was described as a white man with dark hair. And the lady was blonde and between 35 and 45, uh, 35 and 45 years old. And she had some kind of a very distinctive um, dress. Some people called it ugly. Some other people call it sophisticated. It was just a different pattern. It was black. It had pink, um, kind of a reddish tone. I'll talk about more about the dress later on. But just so you know, that's what the neighbors saw at the time. Now, at that point, the neighbor was still looking and she saw Lindsay walking towards the box to get the key. Lindsay's car was parked in the driveway, by the way. She got the key, she unlocked the home and got inside with a couple. There was no car but Lindsay's there and again this was easily blamed on the idea that it was not easy to park in this cul-de-sac so that's it that's all the neighbors saw 
At that point, Jason and his colleague and friend that were going to this hockey game arrived at the home at around 5.40. There are some other um, timelines that say 5.45, but remember that the appointment started at 5.30. That's when they met. Now, as soon as they get there, Jason and his buddy, they saw a couple coming out of the front door but then they saw them just walk right by inside. I mean, it seemed like they wanted to leave, but then all of a sudden they turned around and they went back inside. I have to admit that's kind of weird. And maybe if that was me, I would have done something, called, do something. He felt that it was weird, but he still felt okay to wait for another 10 minutes. Maybe they were not completely done. And Jason at this point was not parked properly. Again, let's come back to the cul-de-sac craziness for not calling a different name. Um, I mean, there is not a proper way to park in a cul-de-sac if there's no room like in between the driveways. So he decided to go around and park on the busier road that is on the side of the house. Remember the one that we talked about previously? He later said that he didn't want to seem like he was being nosy or being a weird, maybe even jealous boyfriend interrupting. So he decided to wait for another 10 minutes before he actually um, started to worry. He finally texted Lindsay, are you okay? She never opened the text. Now, I, I'm not sure what kind of phone they had, but... I'm assuming it was an iPhone that tells you when people open your messages or not. Half of the time, while I had an iPhone, I could see a short sentence on the top, so I wouldn't even open it. So it's just assuming that she never opened the actual message. We're not sure if she saw it um, in the beginning, because of course, then we have the timeline on when she died. He finally, at that point, gets worried and goes to the house and tries to open the front door, but it was locked. He then looked through uh, the glass of the front door and he sees that Lindsay's shoes are there, which is something completely normal if you're a real estate agent or you've been looking around to buy your house. probably know that most people want you to take off your shoes before you enter the house, especially if it's a new build with no carpets and stuff like that. So he didn't worry about that, but he worried that he couldn't see anybody inside. So he started knocking and nobody opens, nobody's moving. So at that point, he was just too worried and decided to call 911. In the meantime, his colleague and buddy just uh, found a gap in the fence and he decided to get in. He saw the patio door, that it was wide open, and told Jason, it's open, we can get in this way. Jason, being worried, he told the operator, I'm going to go in, and he hung up the phone. Now, Jason's uh, buddy came through the property and unlocked the front door for Jason. Jason immediately, with no hesitation, ran upstairs and found Lindsay lying in a pool of blood in the master bedroom. Once you got up, it was easily, um, it was visible um, that she was there, and a lot of people wonder why he went immediately upstairs. I'm assuming that maybe since the friend went through the house to go to the front door, maybe he said something, that's something that we don't know. But, um... When he found Lindsay, that blah, 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 and he called 911 again, and they were already on their way, so they got there pretty fast. Lindsay was pronounced dead when the paramedics arrived. Speculations say, let me put it that way, that she was stabbed over 40 times with no defensive wounds. And initially, people said that, you know, she was probably stabbed from behind, and didn't see it coming, nothing was missing, nothing was stolen. Jason and his buddy were handcuffed 
and taken to the station. I mean, a crime happened and they were there. Eventually, it was confirmed that they were not near the house by surveillance cameras and their testimony and witnesses, of course, in... Of course, they let them go because they couldn't have been at the property when Lindsay was being murdered. Jason even passed a polygraph test. Just so you know, the police confirmed that he was has always cooperated with the police. But one of the things that really made him look bad is that he always refused to give a DNA sample. By the way, if you're thinking, well, that's shady because they could have compared, they should have required him to give a DNA sample. Listen, he wasn't there. He was um, caught in surveillance cameras uh, footage and at the scene, there was no DNA, no fingerprints. So what were they going to match Jason's DNA to? And by the way, Jason's DNA would have been all over Lindsay. They lived together, boyfriend and girlfriend. Kind of makes sense. Now, one of the things that is very well known in this case is that Lindsay talked about the couple as the Mexicans. She referred to them as the Mexicans and not their actual names. Um... It was kind of uh, interesting to know that she even, when she talked to her dad, allegedly, and talked to people, she referred to them as Mexicans. And after doing the research and everything, apparently she didn't even wrote down their names in her personal planner or whatever she used to work. Now, let's go back to the text. Um... Jason's text a couple of minutes away was never open, as I mentioned before. Uh, maybe she saw it on the top, but she didn't open it. At 5.41, Lindsay apparently called a friend that she hasn't called in a long time. But she didn't speak. Or all you could hear is some muffled sounds. And after a while, they concluded that this was a pocket call um, and probably was going on as she was being murdered now let's talk about some speculations okay this is not something that was revealed in the autopsy or anything but let me tell you about some of the things that are known in this case and then I'll go back to what I found about them okay now, some people speculate that, and even the dad mentioned this in the Dr. Phil show that happened somewhat recently, that she was stabbed over 40 times, in, especially on her new breast implants. That maybe they were even aiming for it. Um, it's some speculation, so I'm not saying the dad said that, but some speculation. And some others say that she was nearly decapitated. Mm. and um, all this recently has been denied by people who got insider's information about the autopsy even though the findings of the autopsy were never revealed so not the dad, not anybody should have the information to tell you this happened or this didn't happen now according to reliable sources connected to the police the amount of stab wounds were about between between 10 to 15 and she was not not nearly decapitated this was not an overkill this is something that was confirmed by the police in a statement somewhat confirmed it's not like they came out and say that uh, straightforward um but they do believe that she was walking to show the master bathroom when she got attacked from behind. She didn't see it coming. And they also believe that it was a large knife. And um, part of this new discovery is that at least they shared that her spinal cord was severed. Um, now, um, it can be, maybe not, um, 
but this latest findings kind of um, override the idea that it was a 40 stab wounds. No sex assault or no robbery, no forensic evidence, no trail to follow the murder weapon because it's not a gun. And they do know that the weapon was brought with the people and not inside the house. Now, you have to understand that Jason and his buddy, the Cohen, he was, they, they were investigated thoroughly. And they even have to give a timeline. They put in perspective the text. Um, they told them exactly how they got in, who got in first, and everything they did until the police showed up. The police used this information to create a timeline and they also used it to confirm that everything matches and there are no, there's, there's no lies there. And later on, Jason even reenacted the scene with his lawyer present. Now, why he had a lawyer? Well, I, I'm pretty sure that if you witness what he witnessed and then were, maybe if you were handcuffed and taken to jail, and you have the means to hire somebody. I'm pretty sure you would have gotten one. A lot of people gave him a lot of uh, garbage because of it. But I'm pretty sure that he was pretty scared when he was handcuffed. And instead of believing that he was just there to see his girlfriend. And I'll go why he was there too. Okay. Because there's some, some deeper um, things that were going on other than she was uneasy. Now, when he did the reenactment, um, everything matched again. He never added anything. He never took away anything. He always said the same thing. And this is according and confirmed by the police. Now, some people question the idea of why he went straight upstairs. How did he know she was upstairs? Did he look around? Did he have a feeling? Or did he know that she was going to be up there? Now, friends and colleagues are saying that, you know, this she had this bad feeling about these people and she asked him to be there. So why did he take so long to be there for her? But the other side, of course, says it was her job to meet strangers and this was not out of the ordinary. Now I'm going to tell you what Jason told the police, okay? As I mentioned in the beginning, Jason went to visit a customer where he was going to meet his buddy and then go to their hockey game. Jason was delivering some papers to Lindsay that night too. She could have been uneasy and he said, I'll be there for you. But the main point of him going there, straight there after being at his client's place is that he had that listing. He was the listing agent for that sale. And Liz, Lindsay was representing the buyers. So, the buyers made an offer and Jason's client made a counter offer. So, he wanted to deliver it to Lindsay to close the deal, the sale, as soon as possible. Some people say that this was not a counter offer. This was just the offer initially. Yeah, I am not sure what it is. And it really, it's irrelevant to the point that I'm trying to make here. But so he was going to be there for her outside. But he was actually waiting for her to sign those papers as well and close the deal. All this was confirmed. It could have been a lie. I mean, an elaborate lie. But everything was matched. Everything matched. The police could confirm that the sale was going on, that he was the listing agent for the seller, that she was the, 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 the agent that was helping the buyers, and that the offer was going on, and that, yeah, he needed that signature. Some theories say, well, that she didn't even tell Jason that she was worried about this whole thing, only told her dad and her friends. I personally don't think so. I think she was pretty uneasy with the whole thing. But um, 
she was probably also trying to get used to the idea that this was her job now. And maybe that part of it was meeting with strangers, right? I would have done that. And maybe that's why it makes sense to me that even though she was uneasy with the idea um, of talking to these people and uh, you know that uneasy feeling that she had, maybe she was trying to overcome it, which makes totally sense in my book. Now, it was it was a business and maybe a kind of peace of mind kind of thing that maybe was Jason outside. You must understand that when the police got there, they were probably wondering, what the heck are you doing here? Listen, she's a big girl. I'm pretty sure she can take care of herself. It would have sounded a little bit weird that he was waiting outside. You know, if she was really worried, why wasn't he inside with her? He gave the police this this uh, timeline of events and what really he was doing there and he never changed his story according to the police Jason according to the police again never changed the story and sometimes the police don't release the whole thing so some people believe that he did change his story along the way but it was just because the information that the police was releasing was just in pieces he never added it was just from the beginning the same story Jason was found with no motive either. I mean, why, what did he have to win with this? They did find sock and nylon impression bloody ones, um, kind of a trail that led to where they left their shoes by the front door. And they were confirmed that there was a male and a female um, set of footprints. It was also confirmed that they left from the back and that they could have had a third person as a getaway driver park in the busier street, either on the back of the house or the side. Now, it is also interesting to know that there was this kind of a gap in the fence that they could have and most more than likely knew about it. But there's also a possibility that they were really in fact planning to leave the house from the front door and they were interrupted by jason and his buddy at the front door so they again they walked to the cul-de-sac so they had no car parked at front and everyone assumed that they parked on the side because of the inconvenient parking experience in a cul-de-sac now, the police believe that the people she met show, uh, in, to show the house were the ones who killed her. This white guy with dark hair, six feet tall, I mean, the blonde lady with a reddish pink and black pattern dress. But they found that the dress was not really as unique or as exclusive as people thought in the beginning. This was a very popular dress that was sold in a department store. And I mean, it was kind of busy uh, pattern and unique. But maybe this was something to distract people from looking at her face. And that is one of the theories out there. They still get a sketch of her, not of the guy, but uh, they did get a sketch of her, but no leads on it. The cell phone used by the couple to get in contact with Lindsay was purchased in Vancouver on November 2007, so a few months prior to the meeting, and it was activated the first time that the couple contacted Lindsay, so it was easily confirmed that they purchased this with the sole purpose of using it on Lindsay's murder. It was also tracked back to where it was purchased, but the surveillance footage was erased because it had been so long ago that they really didn't keep it for that long. At least, you know, the surveillance footage. It was registered under the name Paulo Rodriguez and with an address in Vancouver that is not related or involved at all in this whole thing. The phone was purchased for the murder, that is what the police believe, and it was never used after Lindsay's murder. But why Lindsay? Nobody gets it. She was a low-risk lifestyle. That's how she was described by authorities. She had good credit. Um, 
she was not using drugs. She actually hated drugs and what they did to people. She lived a happy life with her boyfriend. And she was doing pretty well in life. Eventually, they continued to investigate Jason, but he, they had to rule him out as a suspect. And that is when Lindsay's dad, Jeff, started to tell another story. Um, completely different of what Jason was telling the police. Uh, Jeff said that Lindsay told him that Jason was being controlling, controlling and possessive and that he doesn't believe that he did it himself but that he plotted to kill her. And he's referring to Jason, of course, the boyfriend. Uh, also, Lindsay's dad says that Lindsay visited him and told him and that she saw something that she shouldn't have. Apparently, the conversation ended there and she said, I'll tell you later. Um, but she never did. And this is what happened. So, let me, let me stop for a minute there because... Because of that statement, a lot of people have been creating some kind of crazy theories. Jeff, Lindsay's dad, never said that. Lindsay said, Dad, I saw something with Jason or about Jason or about his family that I shouldn't have. No, he never. she never said that. Jeff said that Lindsay said or told him that she saw something that she shouldn't have. Period. So this doesn't mean that she's referring to Jason or Jason's family. Also, um, I don't know how or her the it was the situation where she told him, but it's kind of interesting to know that, you know, Jeff didn't push hard enough to know what she saw. It's kind of interesting, right? I mean, maybe it was a conversation like, oh, no. and maybe he took it like, oh, I saw something that was scarring and not really, you know, scary, but scarring kind of thing. I, if that was, I shouldn't have seen that. I can't get that out of my head. I don't know, but she never told him. Now, there are some Jason theories based on what Jeff shared about Jason, okay? Some people speculated that Jason was selling steroids and Lindsay wanted out. So a lot of crazy and not really proof theories. The police investigated Jason. He's completely clean. He's never been selling steroids or there's no evidence that he had. Another theory is that Jason made sure he was caught in camera so he could have an alibi. I mean, why was Jason there? I mean, did he just go there just to make sure that she was dead? Um, but got enough of an alibi with the surveillance camera so he wouldn't be pointed to. Um, did he move the car to signal the killers that they, it was time to leave? Why did Jason bring his buddy? Like a, as a witness? Jason was with... Apparently, according to this theories he had a friend who was a low-grade drug dealer too but all these things really were not uh, able to prove anything the police was not able to prove anything there was no trace there was nothing nothing and they thoroughly investigated Jason he even passed a polygraph for some people, it not a big deal. For some other ones, yeah, it's a big deal. He reenacted the whole thing. He cooperated. He was there every single time the police asked to talk to him. Um, so, it actually didn't make sense. All those theories, at least not to the authorities. So now let's explore his mom, Shirley. Jason's mom. The theories are that Jason and Lindsay met through, well, we know that Jason and Lindsay met through Jason's brother who went to school with Lindsay. So 
Jason um, introduced Lindsay to his mom, and that's how she got the job at the office. She was a junior agent, and Shirley was her manager. Some people say that she hated Shirley. Some other people say that she loved Shirley because, you know, it was like a mentor, a good person to look up to, successful in the business that she was starting. Some people say that Shirley was too involved. Um, one of the things that it said is that um, Shirley bought the house that Lindsay and Jason shared. Which, by the way, is not true. That house has always been Shirley's house. It's in the lake and it's kind of far away. Or a distance, a good distance from Victoria where they worked. And so they stayed there for a while. Uh, but this was kind of a vacation home for Jason's mom. Okay. Another crazy theory out there is that Shirley paid for her breast implants and according to um this is something that it was proven it's not uh, something that you know the parents said or anything like that but Lindsay paid for the implants herself there's also some other theory that says that shirley was involved with drug dealers and that is why she had so much money but according to the investigation by the authorities they couldn't find any links to anything illegal Everything was investigated and she had money because she was a very successful businesswoman who knew what she was doing and invested wisely. So, what's the other theory? Well, they say that Lindsay found out about the family corruption and got rid of her. The investigation shows that there was no drug involvement on Jason's family side or Lindsay herself. You know, it's it's kind of crazy because there's this theory that the couple actually was Shirley and Jason's brother, the actual friend, before she even met Jason. So why would they introduce themselves outside and, you know, Lindsay would have recognized the people. I mean, you gotta be kidding me. They also have verified alibis. I mean... This is another thing that it's very well known in this case, and I thought I should mention it. Later on, Nikki, which is one of Lindsay's friend, she was woken up in the middle of the night by a telephone call. On the other side, it was a lady with a thick accent. She doesn't remember well. It was while she was sleeping, so she doesn't know what the lady was saying. But she got so scared because she remembered what happened to Lindsay when, you know, she was called. And, you know, she started calling this number back. I mean, for somebody who's pretty scared, I mean, she, she that was a pretty gutsy move. She called about 20 to 30 times, according to Nikki. And eventually, Shirley Salo picked up the phone. Um, so... Nikki asked, why did you call me? And Shirley said, well, I don't know who you are, but I was trying to call my assistant, uh, or, yeah, assistant, Nikki, or secretary, I think it was, and maybe Jason added your name Nikki here, and that's why I called you, I'm so sorry. That's what Nikki says. But Shirley, she was asked, several times about this incident and she's always been denying it and the authorities were not able to confirm that this happened it would have been easy come on cell phone pins tracing nothing so i don't know if this girl nikki made this up or if something weird is going on but surely was some somewhat involved in the theories why? Well, her family was connected to the builder, the builder of the house where Lindsay was murdered. Remember, we talk about the Sosa was the name of the street, and the builder was Joe the Sosa. And he was not only the builder, but a family friend and a business associate of Shirley. 
part of the um, cul-de-sac and again that's why his name was brought in um was still under construction so the builder himself joe de sosa was there an hour before Lindsay arrived he was supervising but he was also cleared along with the zelos with any involvement in this case i think i happened to be there in the you know an hour before she got there but he had nothing to do with it finally there was a dateline episode it was called dream house murder and it was revealed in that episode that eight weeks prior to Lindsay's murder she tried to contact her ex-boyfriend while on a visit to calgary to see her dad that's what the dad kind of grabbed and mentioned that she was having trouble with jason and probably that's why she was contacting this ex-boyfriend by the way the ex-boyfriend already had a new girlfriend and you know i i don't know if he was married or if he was um you know i'm not sure if if it was his fiance or whatever maybe engaged um and you must also know that this ex-boyfriend also had uh, a few calls from Lindsay to the police um, for some kind of abuse and i don't know what kind but just just so you know um so that is when Lindsay supposedly told her that she was having problems with jason so the dad maybe put two and two together and assumed that she wanted to talk to this guy because she wanted to come back with him mind you she never told anything like this to her mother to her sister or to any of her friends back home according to her mom and according to her sister she was happy as she could be with jason and according to her friends that was the true she was having a great time with jason and they don't know that we're gonna get married but they knew that they were happy together so it's kind of interesting to see that um she reached out to this guy who she didn't have a great time with and according to the dad she was thinking about coming back with him now let's talk about this other guy and there there is an entire i mean name and two last names yes this case it's getting crazier by the second but uh, she also contacted this um old friend i'm gonna call him eric um again there's a whole lot of information on this guy this was uh, proved by her social media so there is traces that she contacted this guy while she was in calgary but the police would what they don't know is if she was actually trying to reach for him or a family member because she in in the things that they can find on her social media were not as specific as they would have liked mm, this guy eric that i'm gonna call eric um used to live in victoria and now um he was in calgary he was known as a mid-level cocaine trafficker um that moved to calgary this friend was eventually busted when she returned to victoria so as soon as she left there was this big operation called high noon where 14 people are, was arrested and charged in a combined value of over two million dollars of drugs that were off the streets it was a complete success they also got weapons body armors and vehicles with secret storage compartments but guess what this guy eric uh, was caught and he asked for a bail but it was denied the, the the day before lindsay was murdered so he was in jail police eventually confirmed that lindsay was not directly involved in the cocaine ring or as a police informant but they do believe that maybe she was mistakenly or intentionally identified as the real informant in high noon 
let me explain because when I read that at first, I was like, what the heck? What do you mean by mistakenly or intentionally? And it makes sense. I guess you have to have a detective head to make sense in your head. Um, so please believe that whoever took uh, the significant loss of money, you know, over $2 million, in this operation, he ordered a hit on her to set us an example. Now, the informant that he, this is what the police believe, again, this is their theory, is that they believe that he thought it was Lindsay, the informant. Now, why could have been mistakenly or intentionally identified? Let me explain. It could have been because she was mistakenly identified um, by somebody who felt the need to throw a name out there. Or it could have been intentionally identified. So they were trying to distract this quote-unquote big guy from the real informant who was more than likely part of the whole thing and afraid for his own life. So Lindsay was the solution for their problem. Some people said that Jason's family was connected to this organization. Uh, and I just want to mention that in case that you already heard about this and you're thinking I'm excluding it. No. But the only thing that tied them to anybody who was involved in this thing is because Shirley was renting an apartment to a guy who was one at what point it was friends with her sons and um, this was a guy that was renting an apartment from her uh, she kept an eye on him he seemed like he was doing okay he was, he was a good tenant and paid his rent on time and that was the only tie that the authorities found connecting this operation to Jason's family. Another theory claims that the people who threw Lindsay under the bus was um, Shirley and Jason because they were involved as informants or just decided to somebody ratted them out and so they needed somebody to blame and they ended up blaming Lindsay in order to save Jason. That they reacted out of fear. Now, the authorities have not been, okay, the authorities did all the research and everything, investigation, and they confirmed that they've never been informants to the police. And even though this theory was explored by the authorities, it really didn't take them anywhere because they're not involved with any type of drug dealers or cartels, period. I mean, this is a good theory, isn't it? Okay, let's get Jason out of the picture and his family. What if this was somebody else? According to this website um, that I was reading this morning, just kind of um, recapping everything that I learned about this case, the police believe that it could have been somebody else, maybe with an addiction or somebody trying to protect himself or his family or her family. And there are even some names here. So, these people are always afraid of getting busted, you know, or worse, being busted by someone in power in the organization that they are in. So, if, if somebody was trying to protect his family and that person was the one responsible for what happened and the loss of money, they are not going to take the blame they're going to try to find somebody who can they they can blame for this so no money in the world no reward it's gonna make them talk because they know that if they say something that means that th they can be killed or their family can be killed so really if they say something 
and maybe point to the idea that this girl happened to be at the place where you know they got busted and that she knew these people and whatever the theory the latest theory is that a lot of people know what happened to Lindsay but for self-protection and fear that they are going to be killed or their families they're not saying anything According to this website, the police is waiting for a weak link, especially now that, you know, they have something and they're investigating. They're trying to crack somebody to say something because the first person who says something are going to be the one that will have better chances in court. Maybe they can even go in witness protection program. Maybe the police is working on the weak link. They believe that whoever set up Lindsay's murder or pointed to her direction was in the real estate community, though. They believe that this person, the person that threw Lindsay under the bus, according to their theory, gave this couple her cell phone number. That person knew she was not experienced and would try to take this cell even if it was a little bit shady to begin with. How did the buyers knew about the house that was for sale? Well, this person, the one that threw Lindsay under the bus, let's call it like that, probably gave them that information. It was pretty specific, as I said in the beginning. They wanted a nanny suite, they wanted a house with three bedrooms, three bathrooms, no more than 20 minutes away from downtown. They even knew the floor plan. They knew the house had a realtor box that they use, and it has another name. Interestingly enough, all this information must be put into the computer, into the Remax listing database. And who did that? Well, Rian, who happened to be a Spanish girl who was friends with Lindsay. She was a close friend, actually, to Lindsay, and she also had a lot of connections, including that guy who got busted in Calgary, and a lot more people involved in the drug business. Big name bosses so this Rianne worked inside the Raymax office and she was the one to input the information about the De Souza house she entered it into the system she had access to all the information that this quote-unquote Mexicans had now to make things a little bit more fishy she ended up quitting her job the day after Lindsay's murder she gave no reasons, and she haven't cooperated with the police since then. Not even a, a polygraph. She, she has denied that. The police consider her a person of interest and maybe a weak link. Other claims it was a sacrificial slaughter and that she messed with the wrong guy and the masons that rule the local police. Um, are the ones behind it and that is why the police is blaming the whole drug operation in this now I am sure that a lot of this information is stuff that you already know but I know that there is a lot of this information that people still don't know about and some people are still believing some crazy theories out there of what could have happened. The police know that this was specifically for Lindsay. This was planned in advance. This was something that was done by professionals, even though it wasn't done in a way that they do when you are somewhat involved in a cartel, like, you know, a shot to the head. This was more personal. And whoever, whoever planned this whole thing knew her personally. Knew her schedule, knew the kind of person she was. And it only makes sense that whoever 
knew that information works at the Remax office at the time. Is this girl, Rianne, the one that is doing all that? We don't know. And in fact, I have her last name and everything, and I'm not going to put her out in the open like that. I think that calling her by her first name, it's it's enough information. Does the police think that she was the one who planned the whole thing? No, not really. But they believe that she was the one who helped. And so they want to talk to her. She refuses. I don't know if they know where she is. But according to this website that I was reading this morning, um, there's a picture of her with this guy who was involved in the whole thing. I'm not even going to say his name, but, you know, there was a guy involved in the whole operation who, you know, came down in the operation. Now all of a sudden they're together and they're taking pictures and... It's just such a mm, interesting theory because that's all it is. If the police had enough information to say, hey, this Rianne girl did it, they would have arrested her. Or at least they would have had uh, some kind of a warrant for her arrest. But they don't. So they... D- They're looking for something to help her say something. Maybe she has nothing to do with this. And maybe this is just what the police believe, but not really. They're not 100% sure. But now it makes sense. Who would want to do this to Lindsay? There, it doesn't make sense that somebody like Lindsay was involved in all this. So, now looking into everything that we went through today, this theory does make sense. But I'm sure that they don't have enough to do anything about it. So, yes, they're waiting for that weak link. But to be honest, in that kind of world, um, I, I think it's hard to try to get people to talk about something that is not fair, about something that shouldn't have happened, because it's like the self-preservation instinct that we have, that we're like, okay... She's not here anymore. If I say something, you know, I can only imagine that maybe she's thinking or whoever is thinking, you know, if I say something, I'm not going to bring her back and I'm going to put my life in serious danger. And so I can only hope and pray that this is something that eventually will be solved to give the peace that her parents need that her sister needs, that her boyfriend at the time, that the people that knew her need. But this is not a regular case. This is not your typical case where you're like, well, could have been this person, it could have been that person. No, this is, this is much, much bigger than ourselves. And much, much bigger than any other true crime case that I've covered here. And you guys know I don't like to point fingers. That's why I don't give last names. I don't don't tell you about organizations that are being pointed at. Because in the end, um, you know, I don't know if that's helping. I don't know if that's, that's something that's helping the investigation or maybe even just being a pain in the butt for people that do have the power to do something about it. So I don't know if this Rianne has anything to do with that. But it certainly looks bad. It certainly does. Maybe she has nothing to do with it.
But at the same time, maybe she needs the protection. Maybe she needs or her family or somebody she loves. The police is confident that somebody eventually is gonna say something. But as of right now, we end up with a 24-year-old who happened to be wonderful, who happened to be a good friend, a good daughter, a successful, who was supposed to have a great life, who according to her closest people, the people that live close to her, like her mom and like her sister and her friends and colleagues, she was having the time of her life. She was not going through a hard time. And if in fact she was thrown under the bus for knowing somebody who was involved with the wrong people, it really sucks. But I hope that eventually... People can find the peace in knowing what really happened here. This seems like a horrible movie that every time you think it's going to end, something else happens. And there's a new name thrown in the mix and there's a new... It's a, in the end, it can only feel for her family and parents who raised a great person who was doing everything right and ended up being in the crossfire of something that gosh that that just sucks it sucks it sucks think about it for just a second I have a 20 year old boy boy And you know, you take the time, you give a good example, you, you, you take the time not only to teach them, but to love them and to spend time with them and teach them how much they're worth it and, you know, give them a good education. And then all of a sudden, you know, something like this happens and you're like, what the heck? Why? She was not involved in all this. She didn't deserve this. I, I can only put myself in the family's shoes and it's just not fair so I know it's not going to bring her back and I know I know that it's chances are people involved in this whole thing are not going to say anything and but this is like a bad movie a bad movie that you don't want to watch What do you think? I'm going to leave a link down below where the podcast is going to be at. And uh, maybe you can leave your thoughts there. TheMysteryTheory.Lisbon.com TheMysteryTheory.L-I-S B as in boy, Y-N dot com Go there and tell me because I really am lost in all this. I would like to know what you think about it. I hope you have a wonderful week. And until next time, talk to you guys soon. Bye.